professional seminar um, and today we have um, some amazing speakers again from the world of HR and also um, around furloughing and around the, um, the portal, the, the UK government portal around furloughing. Um, what, so today the speakers are going to give you insights into what they're doing for their own organisations around for a HR perspective because I think it's very important that we share um, what we're doing around um, so that people can learn from each other and also collaborate as well. And if there's any questions that you want to follow up with the speakers after um, this webinar, please send in some inquiries into the SB or the info at SBRC email. So this morning we have Carol Lamont from Buzzworks. Um, uh, the amazing restaurant chain that we're all missing at the moment, um, especially down at South Queen's Ferry near me. Um, Julian Bell from EC English. We've got Wendy Toby from uh, Business Stream. We've got Charlotte Edwards from A Squared B. And we've also got David Hughes, our regular, from Adult Hall Good Art. So I would like to introduce you, first of all, to Carol Lamond from Buzzworks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And thanks, Jude. Um, as Jude said, I'm Carol Lamond. I'm the People Director at Buzzworks. Um, you might not have heard of us as Buzzworks Holdings, but you've perhaps eaten in one of our 12 restaurants. Um, as Jude said, Scots and South Queen's Ferry and um, all the other 11 are over on the west side of the country. We have 505 team members. And um, this year, uh, we recently uh, moved the central support team to a new office in Kilmarnock. We have been in the Sunday Times Best 100 Companies to work for for five years in a row. We had a turnover of 20 million. We were going to open three new restaurants in 2020 and we were on track to have a turnover of 50 million pounds by 2025. And then um, coronavirus struck. Um, in hospitality in January and February, then that's the um, time that most of our um, teams actually go on holiday. Um, so the first thing we had to do as a people team was actually track everyone down and then um, give them advice on self-isolation when they actually returned. Next, we went into consultation process with all of our teams about reduction in hours. And um, I think I, I kind of laughed with some of my friends because the policy that you never thought you would ever write in your whole life as an HR professional was social distancing. But we had to write that um, up quite early on um, in the process. As a leadership team, we sat down at five o'clock every evening to hear uh, the government briefings and what effect that would have on our business and on our teams. And we were actually under significant pressure um, to close because um, a lots of our competitors were closing, they were making people redundant, and we didn't want to do that for a couple of reasons. Um, we didn't want to panic our staff, um, and also we wanted to get to Mother's Day because that's a significant event um, within the hospitality calendar, and our, our teams love it. Um, and we wanted to give them the opportunity to earn um, as much money as possible during that period. So for us, it came as a relief on the 20th of March. Sorry, Carol, to interrupt, your slides aren't up. Carol, just if you could oh. share the screen again, if that's okay. Sorry to interrupt you mid-flow there. Okay. Um, let me try that again. Technical problem. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, it just needs to go into slide share and we're good to go. Yeah. There we go. Um, so yeah, so it came as a relief to us on the 20th of March um, when the government um, instructed us to close and also um, when they introduced the GRS scheme um, because that was a lifeline um, for people like ourselves within hospitality. And then we invoked our closing plan. Um, so we spoke to our teams, we made our venues safe and secure, we did stock taking, we um, arranged for people to um, do, go on a rota to look after the fish, um, and also moved all of the plants to the windows so that they would survive hibernation. 
Um, we have um, an app, we partner with Forth, that is our HR um, system and also our payroll system. Um, and Forth, we have the capability, it's like our version of an intranet. So we use that as our main um, channel of communication. And as furlough progressed, or as, as we got any uh, questions into the people mailbox, then we had a rolling FAQ um, on there. Our core people, people principles, we had a few of those. Um, our holiday year ended on the 5th of April. So when we ran that first major payroll after furlough on the 23rd of May of March, then we wanted to pay everybody um, outstanding holiday pay up front. We have a tip share system where we distribute tips front of house and also kitchen. That wasn't due um, to be paid in April. So we wanted to bring that forward. And again, we paid that on the 23rd of March so that people um, would have money to survive through this period. We wanted to go over and above anything that was contractual. So for the people who weren't eligible for the GRS scheme, we came up with our own furlough scheme. We had a number of people who were going to, had resigned and were going off traveling around the world. Then their travel plans had to be canceled and some people who were leaving us to go to other organizations and those companies had withdrawn um, their offers of employment. So it was really humbling as a, an HR um, team to hear the gratitude from people from when we kept them on our payroll. And we changed everyone to weekly pay um, so that it was easier for the GRS scheme. Um, we looked at the government website on a daily basis, as I'm sure everyone else did, because things were changing. We did about four iterations of our furlough letters. I used the phrase unprecedented times um, numerous times. Um, that became the catchphrase of the day, I'm sure, for most HR people. We wanted to deliver on our promises, so therefore our storytelling and taking people at a pace that wouldn't panic them became key to us. Now, I want to apologise for um, everything that is on um, this slide because it's quite busy, but this is testament to just what we had to do from an engagement perspective, and this is only some of the things that we actually did. Um, and I can't take credit for this. This is um, down to my amazing people team. But if you consider the people that we um, hire into hospitality, they're fun, they're outgoing, they work at pace, they love customers, they do unsociable hours, they enjoy being part of a team, and they're the polar opposite to what um, someone would thrive in a lockdown situation. So we knew health and wellbeing and engagement was key for us. So the first thing we did was we partnered with Centre Stage, which is a charity, and our kitchen brigades um, have cooked 4,000 meals, and our front of house people and our leadership team have actually um, packed and distributed those to vulnerable people within the community. We're working with NHS hospitals on providing barista services because um, usually the canteens and the coffee stations are run by volunteers who all those people, um, because of their age, are um, being told to shield. Um, so we're looking at taking those over. Um, we partner with Flow, they do our online training and once um, from furlough that we knew that we could train, then um, we've been promoting Hospital Live, which is their website of all different um, training activities. Um, we um, have our employee assistance programme through a company called Hospitality Action, as well as all the other health and wellbeing things that they do. They provide grants to people within hospitality um, and on the first day of the COVID-19 grant being opened, they had 30,000 applications. So we've donated £10,000 to them. We just recently trained um, all of our leadership team in mental health first aid. So they've supported our wellbeing strategy. We have run online gym sessions. We are doing run five, donate five, um, nominate five. Um, we have run programmes of um, homeschooling. Um, we are doing coffee mornings. If you go onto my LinkedIn um, account, you'll see um, the clap for our NHS um, colleagues, that video that we've produced. There's a little video on there. We've got everyone involved in that. Um, every evening we support our MD in producing a blog to ensure that people are connected. We keep our FAQs update. We run coffee mornings. We do quizzes. We do virtual DJ sessions. And today, 
um, we are doing a virtual Bake Off and last night it was amazing to see everybody posting on the app all of our videos um, on how the cooking is actually going. So a lot on a lot of engagement work that we're doing. So looking at the future and what the new normal is, um, then I think we have to have a crystal ball as to what predictions would be and look east and look to Europe as to what the trends are there. And it will be really interesting as to public opinion again uh, versus restrictions, because if you think about um, this country, then we have pubs and restaurants are part of our culture. Um, so I speak to a lot of people and they say, oh, we can't wait until we get back into a restaurant so that we can meet our friends and have a drink. But what will that mean? Um, and will people really um, do that? Will they come out um, in droves at the beginning? Will that tail off? And a lot of that will depend on phasing. So will the government phase by demographics? So age, geography, will the open restaurants first? Will the open pubs last? And we're working currently on return to work checklists where we have to screen everybody, all of our teams who come in every day for temperatures and masks. And what does social distancing mean um, for front of house, kitchen and office environment? So front of house, we are um, talking about that. Do we have to get the old hostess trolleys out and uh, do social distancing via hostess trolleys? In kitchens, especially when they're small kitchens, then how can people social distance? We know that we're going to have to take tables out. So that's 50% of our revenue. And so therefore, we're going to have to go through a period of business transformation and consultation, because if you take out half the tables, half the revenue, what does that mean for um, our team members? Will the government extend furlough um, to help businesses like us come out the other end when it won't be straight back to normal? And then our opening um, plan will be a reversal of our closing plan. But we also have to consider um, the hours and the days and also the rotas and the impact um, on our teams. And lastly, um, what have my learnings been from this? Then storytelling is really important and how you take people with you and especially at that, their pace so that you don't frighten them. Um, checking the government and NHS websites daily. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate and communicate again because when the government changes something or Martin Lewis for example goes on TV and says something then we know because our inbox is inundated. Um, keep your plans flexible and I always like to stay half a step ahead so you're doing some work but it's not finalised because whatever the government um, comes out with with instructions and we would have to revisit that again. Use your network and webinars. And I'm not ashamed to say that sometimes during this, I have felt out of my depth, especially with furlough, when um, information wasn't readily available um, at the beginning. Um, and for me is what do we want to be known for? For us, because we've been in um, the Sunday Times best 100 companies to work for five years in a row, then um, being known for looking after our people is really key for me. And health and wellbeing, so um, as a leader, we have to be fit enough to lead during these unprecedented times. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And that was amazing, not just looking after your own staff, but also what you're doing for the NHS and everything as well, and how quickly you've mobilised all that. So credit. And I don't, I don't see any of this stuff in the press, so we need to get that out there about how amazing you guys are, what you are doing for everybody. So... Thank you very much. Um, next is Julian Bell from EC English. That's great. Thanks very much. And um, great, great stuff coming there from yourself, Carol. Um, I certainly think a lot of the health and well-being uh, initiatives that you put in place, we can certainly learn from. Um, but I've been asked to talk a bit about from an HR's practitioner perspective of how the crisis has panned out for us globally. Um, talk a bit, a bit about the experience that we've had, some of the solutions. And then obviously thinking a bit about what's next um, and also indulge me a little. I'm going to talk a bit about the role of HR and how it's more important now than ever before for us to be connected with the, with the, the business and making sure we're helping driving um, the business strategy. But first, just quickly, a slide about EC English. Um, <clears throat> we're a global English language training provider. Um, unless English is not your first language or you have a, a, um, a teenager that wants to learn English, you've probably not heard of us. Uh, we, we train on a normal year, 55,000 students. We operate in eight countries, 25 locations from California to um, Boston, LA, 
South Africa and Australia, New Zealand, um, but we're based in Malta and that's our Maltese office. Uh, we've got 1300 employees and I'm the uh, HRD for the business. Um, I thought I'd put this slide in because this is what it feels like or felt like on a daily basis. Hopefully you'll know the film Groundhog Day. Um, questions but no answers, some of the answers but not the filling of the gaps, um, various delays around the world, conflicting information coming through, and the media running faster than sometimes we can um, uh, keep up with, as Carol mentioned, inundated with questions from employees and we just didn't have the answers at the time. But it's also about the pace of change and, and it's been interesting to see how that's, pla that's played out globally. The speed of the breakouts, the government's decisions, the schemes they put in place. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's very much a, a, a changing world. So for us, the global challenges we were faced with is, as I say, this development of the pandemic. Um, a and our, our business in Australia and New Zealand we bought uh, just the end of last year, it was later on in the day. They still had people flying in and flying out, students arriving, students leaving. Um, whereas in the likes of our schools in New York, uh, we had a few emails from angry parents of students sent direct to our chief executive and myself demanding why we weren't shutting the schools and it was a, it was a health hazard uh, whilst we were uh, desperately following the government's guidelines. So real difference in the development of the pandemic and how that featured in the cultures and attitudes. Um, I heard uh, the other day on a call in the UK where we were waiting for the government to come out with schemes and ideas, whereas in the US they weren't really believing sometimes some of the, uh, the options that were being played out and taking matters into their own hand. Of course, in different countries, there's different rules about um, redundancy or layoffs as we have in Canada. Uh, and the, the concept furlough was brand new for the UK. Uh, we have eight different government solutions. As I said, different timings for them coming out, different attitudes and risks and behaviors. Um, asking employment lawyers who traditionally give you a, a cast iron, clear direction, here's what the law says, here's what you should be doing. Uh, to getting conflicting advice from different lawyers, um, not only in the same country, but also from the same uh, company sometimes. I, I famously remember one lawyer said, you're in uncharted territory, hold your nose and jump, uh, which kind of plays against all the HR uh, uh, legal um, following of guidance within me. But uh, as I said, it's, it's unprecedented times. And for us, and I'm sure a lot of you felt this, the cash flow problem, it's all very fine and well, uh, government saying, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna open up this money to you, but the delay that it takes for us to get that, those funds from the government. Um, in New Zealand, they pay the companies up front, which allows you to pay the cash flow. In Ireland, they promise to pay two days after you've made the submission. Uh, we've just found out recently, obviously in the UK, it's six days, uh, but in Australia, it's 30 days lead time. So that in itself can have a massive impact on cash flow. Um, being a global business, we have the opportunity to move funds around the world, which really has helped us, but it's, it's not been easy by any stretch of the imagination. So what creative solutions did we come up with? Here's just a few of the ideas. Obviously, new product development. We're, we're a full immersion, which means a student will come to us and spend the summer, three months, living in a local family, mixed with cultures from around the world. Um, in the evenings, if they're in London, they'll go to the, the London Eye or they'll have a day trip to Oxford. Or if they're in LA, they'll do surfing lessons and something like that. Clearly, that's not, that's not a possibility. So we've fired up our online market. We had an offering some time ago, um, but it, it's, it wasn't successful as we wanted it to be. Over one weekend, we created an online um, a platform through Teams, or rather we used Teams online platform, and we created our online syllabus. And we were often running over weekends. So the necessity of invention, it, it, it does speak, speak uh, volumes there. In terms of customer flexibility, we were able to offer students to fly to some of our schools elsewhere around the world to finish their studies, or indeed to start their studies. Clearly that changed when the whole world went into lockdown but also deferring bookings, rebookings, giving people vouchers to avoid um, the, the refunds where possible, but if they demanded it, then we obviously offered that. Um, but this, this cyclical nature of, of trying to um, get flexibility from our, our customers, but also from a workforce. Um, we opened up online training, so the Australian students, uh, teachers rather, could work in the evening um, to train our European South African customers in the morning. 
or indeed Boston in the afternoon, is Europe's South Africa evening. So suddenly we're doing remote training from uh, teachers all the way around the world. So some breakthrough thinking from that perspective. Some teachers weren't up for this, um, not able to present in the on, online, they were used to doing it face to face, uh, but also some were just not able to given um, home care arrangements. Supply chain flexibility. Um, we've changed our attitudes to our suppliers in some of them who were very late in paying. And I think everybody, that pressure has cascaded itself right the way through the supply chain of people really seeking payment, whereas maybe we would have relaxed the payment terms before. And as I mentioned, um, paying wages, staggered approach, how we can maximize uh, the global reach that we have. And last but by no means least, it is challenging this future cost base. For us, the gestation period, the length of time it takes somebody to book a, a training course could be as much as a year. So when the, company, when the country comes back online, we're not gonna be able to switch on immediately. Uh, so it's gonna take us some time to get back up to our organization. So we're challenging the size and the service required from our support functions. And for HR, it's a bit like, well, let's get back to basics. And I'm sure there's plenty of people on this call that were doing engagement surveys, performance management, corporate social responsibility, training needs analysis, all that's being put on the back burner. So how and when do you, do you phase that through? So was it a dream? <laughs> what was next? Are we in Kansas anymore? Definitely not. So as I've said, we will see the recovery of the industry in different phases, but for us in our industry, it'll take 12, 18 months, maybe longer. Market evolution or revolution? We think full immersion will still exist because people still want to learn face to face, but it has opened up a whole new online and also a direct market for us rather than go through agents, um, like a stage agents have been pressurized through um, people selling by the owner. The same is for us in our, in our industries and selling direct to the customer rather than through agencies. The route to market is definitely the survival of the fittest. We're probably the third largest in the world, and yet we've got a fraction of the market share. So there's a massive long tail, which will just not sadly be able to recover from this business. So there is gonna be a shakeup and only the fittest will survive and come into the new year, uh, there'll be a different uh, landscape that we'll be operating with, our, with our, uh, our competition. Challenging the organization design, challenging the cost structure, having a real think almost startup mentality, blank bit of paper, how would you design your organization? rather than what have we got, how can we cut back? And that's starting some very interesting conversations with the exec team. I mentioned about the people agenda, back to basics. Some of the great stuff that we had earlier this year will need to resurrect, but in what order and on what priority? And lastly, employee commitment. Um, it is challenging when uh, people are furloughed on low salaries. Um, in some parts of the world, you get to see the engagement levels playing out real time. And how can we continue to keep our employees engaged throughout this challenging time. There's one point I do want to touch on is work from home, and, and I think there's plenty of material out there, uh, but there's some interesting statistics coming out. There was a, there's an article from HR Network Scotland on working from home, uh, where it talked about people working harder, longer. There's obviously loads of information about mental health, suffering, stress, the guilt factor, people who've still got a job, a survivor syndrome for when you're making organizational restructures, that is playing out. Um, I'm a judge on the HR network panel, and I'm sure there'll be lots of very interesting um, applications for health and well-being, for example, as one of the award. Um, it's free to enter, and you've got until the end of May to do it. But it's all about what HR can do to help the business move forward. And as I say, you can't spell hero without HR. So just indulge me for the last couple of minutes. This is a model I've used a few times with organization. I'm sure some of you have seen it already. Um, Burson's model by Deloitte's, they've got 11 frameworks on the right hand side. There's a link at the bottom there, which you'll see when the slides come through. But I just wanted to focus on one being the HR. Very busy slide, but this encapsulates all the various elements of the HR function uh, that we provide a service to the business. And we are going through a review on what's worked well in the yellows. So leadership and management, some of our engagement strategies and our people, culture and performance. But likewise, some of the areas that we need to work on workforce planning we talked a bit about the global mobility of our workforce or organization design shared services we are still very much regionalized when it comes to hr finance it so that's driven some of our centralized thinking and shared services and as you can imagine labor and the unions different responses depending on our relationships around the world in canada and australia there's one last slide here i won't dwell on it too much but that's the second part of the burson deloitte's model and it talks about what level do you feel hr is in your business 
and assess what level do you think the business needs HR to step up to? Are you compliance and driven HR services or are you truly business integrated? So hopefully that's been interesting. I'm sure there's lots of stuff you guys are already doing, but a perspective from a global organization in the corona world. Thanks very much. I'm now gonna pass over to Wendy. Uh, thanks, Julian. Um, I think if you can stop unsharing your screen, I can then share mine. That's great, thank you. Hi, so my name is Wendy Tooby. I'm the Head of People and Development at a company called Business Stream. And many people haven't heard of Business Stream, so I just thought I'd give you a quick snapshot of who we are. Uh, we are the second largest water retailer in the UK. Um, so we, we bill for water to about 340,000 businesses across not just Scotland, but also England and the whole of the UK. Um, we employ about 400 people uh, across three, uh, four different sites. Uh, we've about 11 years experience operating in a really quite competitive market with not very large margins. Um, those of us in Scotland here will know that we don't pay for our water as residents, um, but only as businesses. So we deal with businesses in England and Scotland, not personal residences. Uh, we provide a range of services, uh, billing. We also do a lot around water efficiency um, and waste management solutions. So a lot of our customers are, for example, Morrison's just now, um, a lot of the, for example, abattoirs, the breweries, um, anybody who needs water, we help them. Anybody with um, chemicals, we support the power stations in terms of how they churn and cleanse their water coming back out and back into the water system. A couple of stats about us. Um, our biggest um, element for, is around um, our experience. It's uh, also around what we can help to save our customers. So our mantra is uh, water efficiency and um, the, the way that we can help a, a business and why you should come to our organization versus anybody else's is that we will help and work with you to save you water and therefore reduce your bills. Uh, we'll also reduce waste, we'll also help the environment and we're helping companies to improve the carbon footprint. So a couple of things we're also trying to progress in the background is our own environmental quality controls and that's really our USP as an organization in retrospect or, uh, against any of our competitors in the water industry. So COVID has hit us as well, and we're predominantly, we have a number of field people who go out and about and support on these kind of water um, efficiencies. We've got a contact centre with about 200 staff, uh, and we've got a head office. We're predominantly based in Edinburgh at the Gael. Um, we had definitely didn't have a working from home culture before COVID um, hit. And uh, probably a week before when it was looking like we were moving into social distancing and a week before everybody was informed that they now had to stay and work from home. We brought out our business continuity plans, dusted them off, uh, formed a disaster recovery team and started doing a trial, a phased trial of getting our contact centre home. So what we found out was that people didn't have laptops. Um, we uh, didn't know if our systems were going to hold up. We definitely didn't know if our telephony was going to work. Um, but we were desperately um, wanting to maintain our business rather than have to take up the furlough option. And probably poignant to mention at this point, we have not to this day furloughed anybody at this point in time. Um, we've managed to enable everybody to work from home. And at the moment, we're working on productivity and efficiency of that rather than um, uh, considering whether or not we are able to, to whether we've not got enough work to be able to furlough people. So literally over overnight, uh, we went from 40%, 50%, 60% of our workforce working from home. And then on the Friday when the announcement came, that was as on Monday, nobody came in. Um, we started immediate daily roll calls. It was for us about support to our customers. What did they need to know? How were they going to be able to reach us when they phoned in? Um, at that point in time, also our customers were being told they couldn't go into their businesses. So probably 80, you know, about 80% of, of our businesses have closed and our customers have closed and had questions about what was going to happen. We had regulatory issues with that in terms that they still have to, if you're in a vacant building or an empty building, you're still obligated to pay your water charges. So um, other teams within the organization have worked really hard to be influencing regulation for temporary suspensions to some of those measures. 
um, where we've been able to and they've been working hard to support customers from that perspective and really leading the industry across that. We are looked to by Scottish government to, to lead on those types of things. Um, we created FAQ portals for both customers and staff um, and we're delighted to be able to say that we managed to influence in England um, a, a temporary suspension um, for people in, uh, on paying their bills for people in England and we're working on that currently now to follow through for Scotland. Um, so getting everybody from home was to work from home was in fact very interesting. Um, so we have had a lot of goodwill and I think to Carol's point earlier people were really enthused to do whatever they could to enable our business to keep on going. Um, so we have uh, probably 50 to 70 percent of our workforce working from their personal laptops where they had a device at home uh, and also working from their personal mobile phones. We discovered that we had the technology that we just had not been using to be able to safely do that through a number of secure servers so that we were reassured and, and very comfortable that with our data um, and that that was uh, fine but what we weren't um, so sure about was whether or not our systems could hold that um, capacity of people dialing in through a different route and of course I think everybody noticed on those first few days that you know Webex, Citrix, everybody who had any type of remote access system was struggling due to the volume of different routes of people dialing into their work servers. Um, we stabilised after probably about a week um, and I'd say we're now a couple of weeks in so we're what, week five or week six um, we are now um, probably at 85% productivity across the organisation and we know that we've probably got 26 members of staff who currently don't have any device to work off of and we're supplying them with back office um, work, so uh, dialing off of their mobile phone, sending things through, through really clunky methods but we're able to continue to keep them with some form of work that's continuing to keep our organisation operating. Um, we immediately then turned our attention to um, the company that we had um, bought in October last year and um, we still have a tupi ongoing there where and they are operating as a white label company for a numbers of our customers. They still had all of their um, employees in the office and we turned to being able to support them to get their employees to work from home as well down in, in Bradford and we did that through basically our own third party supplier relationships. We managed to source um, some laptops for them through our own connections and also additional licenses through our IT systems to be able to get their telephony systems working etc. So that was a real priority for us as they're going to be our, you know, they'll be our employees in, in kind of 12 months time. Um, in addition, um, social media, and I think everybody's mentioned this, has just been absolutely critical. So um, communicate, communicate. We had we really encouraged WhatsApp groups being set up. We um, specifically for our contact centre staff suggested um, prioritise working from home guidance for managers, working from home guidance for staff, um, setting up um, morning calls, evening calls, so that we could make sure that not only uh, our priority was people's well-being and I guess the, the mental health, but also then eventually into productivity, efficiency, call volumes, how were we managing, how were we managing to answer customers, how were we managing to get work done. And where we've noticed the real difference is that um, resistance probably noticed in organisations to want to use some of these um, house parties, the hoots, Teams, um, that's really, we've really taken some additional, I suppose, risks and, and chances there and we've let people use whatever has been right for their team and it's been very successful. We've managed to stay in contact with everybody and we also know that we're right on top of any wellbeing issues as soon as they may come to us or, or happen and, and we have had a lot of that. A lot of people who in a contact centre environment do not want to work from home as, as many industries will be experiencing. They're working off of ironing boards um, as desks because it's an adjustable surface. Um, they're working off of bedside tables or, or window sills. And at the moment, we're actually looking at how do we get headsets out to people because our personal mobile phones are, are overheating in some circumstances. So we're coming up against some really interesting challenges and we're just, every time one comes up through our, our business continuity response team, we're bringing it in centrally um, and we're feeding it back out again into a solution for the team. So very reactive. Um, in addition, um, we then suddenly thought, wow, we'd better refresh some policy training so we find a way to get our policies back out to people because it is important to us, not only that our 
uh, data is secure with this new change of working, but also that our employees know that we're thinking of them. And actually, instead of having nice calls, they're predominantly getting really um, unhappy calls and angry calls from customers who don't understand why they still are paying bills or being chased for potentially disconnections whilst they're in a really difficult time. And actually, we have also stopped uh, and put a temporary suspension on anything like a disconnection, which is another really good piece um, of work to support our customers. Um, and we also um, re-evaluated our social media guidance, which needed a little bit of changing, but just a, re a reminder, because again, our, our team managers were really worried about how people were going to start talking um, and whether they'd be appropriate or inappropriate in a team environment, in the work environment, by using um, something that they would normally see as a social media, like, like WhatsApp. And we hadn't really been doing that as an organisation until now. Um, we also mobilised our staff alert text messages, which we have never really used before other than in a test scenario. We only bought a system less than 12 months ago and we realised that actually our policies and our processes for updating that system, which had been monthly to date, um, just weren't actually good enough. So we've now changed our process to update our staff alert text message system to be weekly um, so that we can be assured that it's 100% accurate and everybody's getting our messages. We also added in contractors, third party suppliers who actually, th those that were um, really needed to hear our communications and know whether they should be in the office, out the office, etc. Um, and fun, um, I think whilst not going to the full extremes, we have continued to do a staff quiz every day across the whole organisation. We've, um, we have a a very key kind of cultural uh, mantra making a positive difference which talks about our communities our customers our people and our environment and we've continued to support instead of um, doing charitable work throughout the workplace we've continued to find different ways of doing that making donations to our charity partners continuing to uh, in fact today we've got um, an environmental audit going on virtually um, etc etc so we continue to just try and find different ways of enabling business as usual to continue. And it's been a challenge. Um, there's been many challenges. I think I've already mentioned tele telephony and technology. Um, it's amazing um, for years, I've heard many stories of organizations saying, oh no, we can't do that. No, 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 our IT systems won't let us work from home. They won't let us do this, we can't do that. And it's amazing when forced with a challenge like COVID, how quickly um, workarounds are created. And I'm really proud of the work that our um, IT team and IS team did to enable all of our people to be able to work from home and I'm, I'm proud and actually our teams are proud that we've not had to furlough anybody at this point in time. Um, employee wellbeing has ramped up. I'm so glad we launched a, a wellbeing strategy earlier this year and that we have a really solid working group. We've continued our working group as a virtual call and uh, in fact ramped it up from a monthly meeting to a weekly meeting and that now feeds our employee comms on a weekly basis. So we've created new web pages, um, displaced, uh, displaced screen equipment, um, working from home has caused challenges, you know, back issues, um, people who want keyboards, mouse, they don't have them, they're working on press, they don't have headsets. So there's so many different issues coming up. And what we're really trying to do is focus on also a short term solution, but then now we're starting to work into what would those longer term solutions potentially be um, in terms of pulling um, uh, wellbeing solutions um, and sending technology or, or, or adaptations back to people's houses to help them work better at home. Um, we've got lots of things we've had to overcome. Um, our mail, everybody's had to overcome where their mail goes, but a huge percentage of our cash population uh, is, is about coming in under, um, is about coming in through checks. Um, and we still need to get those checks processed manually and to the bank now that the banks have reduced hours, so we've overcome some of those challenges. Um, and we have two paid in, 16 new employees and 150,000 customers in the last two weeks whilst we've been locked down on COVID. We've had to completely readapt our onboarding process, our induction process. Um, we've had whiteboards delivered to people's houses. We've been using Zoom rooms in order to do system training and breakout areas, and it's worked. And those people are now, whilst it didn't take you know a week, it took two weeks, they're now working. Um, as they should be. We committed to people who had job offers with us and we've continued to do virtual inductions for them um, and also we've, we're launching a transformation program. Um, this is a massive new billing system that will be um, implemented across our whole organisation but it's time bound. We can't not do it um, and so we've 
really mobilised a huge amount of working teams to be able to say, right, what are the challenges with this? What can we do? What do we need to do? How do we do this in an environment where it's ambiguous as to how long we're going to be working from home and won't be in the office? Um, but what's the essentials that we need to get done? Um, and that will have to move forward. And, and that's been launched in, in the last couple of weeks as well. And managing the pace would be my key takeaway. Um, I, I agree with everything that Carol also said earlier on, on hers around the learnings managing the pace, when to plan re-entry. We are thinking about it, we are planning it, but we're also thinking about those learnings at the very beginning where the government guidance changed on a daily basis. And um, as a result of that, um, whilst we're planning in the background, we're keeping those plans tentative and a little bit loose and just really waiting for what the government's going to come out and when we'll have to mobilise back into that day-to-day -day reactiveness again, which I'm sure we'll end up doing. So BAU is ongoing. Um, it's been a challenge. Um, HR, IS, the operations, everybody has been working their socks off to get it done, but it has been possible uh, and uh, I just wanted to share that with you and share some of the challenges that we've overcome and uh, that's me. Thanks Wendy. Um, some really nice comments coming in uh, from everybody about uh, all of the information that's coming out and the good news stories as well. So that's really nice to hear to have a webinar that's got good news stories on it rather than doom and gloom and what people have to have to do. So well done, everybody. Um, next, we have Charlotte from A Squared B. Morning, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen with you to get my slides up. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm Charlotte Edwards. I'm an employment taxes senior manager at Anderson, Anderson and Brown. Although for the last four or five weeks, I think I've done nothing other than talk about, read about um, and dream about furlough. So this morning, I actually want to talk to you about the portal. Now that that's open, we've hopefully got a few more answers than we had before. Um, the scheme was announced by the government on the 20th of March, so it's taken HMRC just over a month to get that open, working day and night. We know there's been a huge reallocation of staff across HMRC, and um, we've received countless letters in terms of inquiries that we've got open where HMRC are stopping those because they need to dedicate as many of their resources as they can to the actual portal um, and helping businesses through this. The portal itself is accessed via your online agent uh, or your agent's PYE account um, and you just log in through the .gov.uk website to actually make the claim. 185,000 businesses applied on day one of the scheme. So on Monday, that covered 1.3 million workers who have been furloughed and 67,000 of those claims were made in the first 30 minutes. So you just know that businesses were there waiting to get that claim in to get the, the monies out to them. All in all, the system seems to be coping reasonably well. Um, it can cope, according to HMRC, with up to 450,000 claims a day. So that's quite a substantial number. And I think it goes to show the, the commitment that the government has made to the scheme and, and the levels that they're expecting. Um, the funds, once you've made your claim, will be paid into your UK nominated bank account within six working days of you making the claim. You can't get that paid into an agent account or your lawyer's account and it looks like if you try to put in any overseas bank details, the claim will not go through. So it needs to be a UK bank account that you're using. And HMRC are requesting that businesses don't contact them until at least 10 working days after you've made the claim if you haven't received the monies, just because they're obviously going to be inundated with a lot of correspondence. So if you try and phone after eight days, they're not going to be able to help you. So in terms of making the claims itself, you can only do it once every three weeks. So if you run a weekly payroll, then you need to consider what's the best timing to, to make that claim. Um, if you operate, say, a weekly and a monthly payroll, and they're both going through the same PYE reference, you have to collate the claim together um, and process it as one claim. You can't go into your online account and do them separately. We had a client earlier in the week who tried to do that and they, tried, they ran their weekly payroll, 
did their claim for it and then went back in to do the monthly and the system wouldn't let them. So they spent eight hours on hold to HMRC to try and get them to undo that claim so they could do it all together because the monthly one was really where they, they needed the funds to be able to pay the staff. Um, claims can be made in anticipation of a payroll run that's coming um, or it can be done at the point you're running payroll or it can be done after you've run your payroll. HMRC have said that if you can sort of claim two weeks in advance, so if your payroll is not being run for another two weeks, you could be making a claim now and that would be considered in anticipation of an imminent payroll run. Um, but bear in mind that you've got six working days to get those funds. So if you're going to need those monies to be able to pay your staff, then you're better getting that claim in ahead of actually running the payroll. You can backdate your claim to the 1st of March if you had employees on furlough then, or for the first date an employee was furloughed um, to the end of the current pay run. So when you put your claim details in, it will ask for a blanket sort of date that you're claiming for. So you put your first date in, there's the date the first employee was on furlough, and then up to the end of the period that you're claiming for. You don't need to put in individual claim dates per employee. And right now you cannot amend a claim, so you have to make sure that everybody's included in there or you're going to miss out and you'll need to wait until next time. So what's needed to make the claim? I'm not going to go through all of this because it's all available um, on the .gov website with the guidance, but it's important to have all of this ready and available before you actually start to make your claim. Um, you need to know the values that you're claiming. The system, I've had this discussion with a few clients, the system does not calculate it for you. The values that you're inputting into the portal have to be the values that you're looking to claim to furlough your staff. Um, there is a basic calculator available online now. HMRC have um, got that updated pretty quickly, but it only deals with the most simple of scenarios. If you've got energy sort of on a pro rata period or any complications where they've got variable pay rather than straightforward salary, the calculator isn't going to be able to cope with that. So what happens after you've claimed? Well, you'll be given a claim reference number that you have to keep a hold of. Um, and if you, there's any issues with payment coming through to the account, that's what you would use if you call HMRC to discuss it. You need to tell your employees that a claim has been made and that they don't need to do anything or take any further action. Um, and then you need to pay their wages if you haven't already. You also have to keep a copy of the calculations. Remembering that HMRC have reserved the right, and they've said this throughout um, the, the sort of setup of the scheme and the portal, and it's been reiterated by the Chancellor as well. They reserve the right to audit your claim at a later date. Um, I'm suggesting to clients they maintain records for six years because that's how long you need to hold payroll records for. So if you've just got all that information there, it'll make it easier in the event of a future inquiry. Um, I really do think that inquiries are going to become reality in the coming years. Um, obviously, we'll need to wait until things are a bit calmer before HMRC start looking at that. But right now, there is not enough time or people at HMRC for them to check that claim ahead of them paying it to you by backs. When you submit your claim, it does say HMRC will now check this and issue payment. But if Backs takes three working days to turn around and the payment's going to come to you within six. How much checking can they realistically carry out in that time period? So just be aware of that. The guidance is constantly changing. So I'm suggesting to clients as well, keep a record of why you've done things, why you've based your calculations on that in March, and then maybe you've changed them in April. So if you've constantly got records of um, what you've done and the basis for doing it, then you should be okay if HMRC come along and audit you at a later date. And then just some practical tips that we've seen as we've been making countless claims this week. Um, if you've got 100 employees, you can upload an Excel sheet into the system. If you've got 99 employees, you have to input them one by one. So it really is a case of um, going through the portal and putting them in one by one, but you can copy and paste. So if you've got your Excel sheet there with all your employee details, then you can just copy and paste them um, into the portal. For NI numbers, this is causing some confusion and some issues. If you're uploading the spreadsheet, the system doesn't seem to be validating the NI numbers. It's just accepting your spreadsheet. If you're um, putting them in manually because you've got less than 100, you must have an NI number or it's not letting you move through the system. But 
people will know that you don't necessarily need an NI number to be on payroll. It's perfectly valid. You could be on payroll without one. So there's a couple of um, workarounds to that. And what we're suggesting to clients is if you don't have an NI number at all and it's or you have a temporary NI number for maybe an overseas employee that the system's not recognising. If you put in AA six zeros and then A, the system is accepting that and putting the claim through. Um, the system does time out after 30 minutes of inactivity. So if you've uh, started your claim, then gone and uh, taken a call or responded to some emails and you come back, your whole claim so far will have been lost. You can't save it. Um, you have to complete it there and then. So make sure that you're not staying and um, you're not losing that work that you've already done because the system's gone inactive. And then yesterday, just when I thought I got my slides all up to date, as always happens, something came in overnight, um, hot off the press from our uh, contact at HMRC. In terms of the NI number, they are now accepting claims via phone. So if you've got somebody without an NI number, they'll accept that you can uh, phone them to make your claim. We've got some clients who are having real issues with their PayU logins. Um, HMRC are sending them out by post. They can't get to the office to go and collect them. So one of my clients this morning has phoned and um, tried putting their claim through via uh, the, the telephone line. And so far, it seems to have gone through and HMRC have accepted it. So it is supposed to just be for NI numbers. But if you can't get online, then just give it a go. It's better than waiting who knows how long until you're able to get online to the PayY dashboard. They are working on a solution to being able to correct claims. So if you know you've missed somebody or you've put a typo in or whatever it might be, they're working on a solution for you to be able to correct that um, going forward. And there was something came out as well that HMRC have now confirmed that you must confirm in writing to an employee that they've been furloughed. So that has to be done in writing. It's not necessary that the employee responds, but as long as you've um, complied with the employment law obligations and you've written to them to confirm they're being furloughed, then that should be sufficient. They've said keep records of that communications for five years. But as I said before, if you keep everything for six years, that'll just tie up in terms of the payroll records that you need. So that's everything from me on the portal. I think David's coming up next. So if anybody has any questions specifically, then I'll, I'll keep an eye on that to answer them as David's speaking. Thanks, Charlotte. Over to you, David. Um, thanks, Jude and Charlotte. Um, I've got my video screen off just now, not because I'm sitting in my pajamas, um, I promise, but because my internet connection is quite poor this morning. Hopefully it will last out um, while I go through this short talk. We've only got that's left. So I'm going to run through everything that I was going to talk about very, very quickly. But if there are questions at the end, we'll, we'll see if we can squeeze in some time for these. Um, I've been dealing with furlough a lot over the last few weeks, as you'll imagine. And since the first announcement about the scheme, there have been multiple iterations of the guidance. More recently, we've had directions issued by the Treasury that give um, clarity on how the scheme works and when and how it may properly be used by employers. But there do remain some very important areas where the guidance and directions are unclear, missing essential details that appear to be contradictory. And I wanted to speak about one of these, which is in relation to holidays, which has proven to be a particularly thorny subject for those dealing with furlough. Um, we can reasonably infer from the guidance that it is possible to take holidays during furlough and a period of holiday won't break furlough, so it won't break the three week period that you have to be furloughed for. Um, it's also clear now that holidays um, must attract normal pay paid in accordance with the working time regulations, and furlough grant funding will still be paid during holiday periods, so employers are only required to top that up to full pay. But what isn't clear yet is whether employers can require employees to use up holidays during furlough periods, but obviously there'd be a benefit in doing so. It means holidays aren't going to back up um, to be taken in the future, and you will get government um, grant funding when holidays are being taken. Um, there are lots of different arguments about this. I was going to go into them in a bit of detail, but I won't do so simply because time won't really permit now. But suffice to say, the guidance, the directions, not even the ACAS code provide clarity in relation to this point on whether employers can do what they're otherwise entitled to do, which is to serve notice requiring employees to take holidays. Um, for me, it doesn't seem to be terribly different requiring employees to use up holidays during lockdown when employees are working from home as opposed to them taking holidays during furlough. The same principles will apply. They're stuck at home, they can't really do what they would normally do on holidays. 
but they do still get a break from work. And I can't really see why there should be a distinction between um, taking holidays during working from home, during lockdown, or taking holidays during a period of furlough. It's not a necessary requirement that holidays are only taken from time that the employee would otherwise be actually at work, which sounds a bit strange, but it's a principle that's been established um, in the Supreme Court um, some years ago in relation to offshore workers who are typically required to take holidays during what's called field break. So that's time when they're not working. Um, my view in relation to all of this, and it's an opinion only, is that provided the employer doesn't seek to abuse the rights under the working time regulations to take holidays, for example, by asking employees to use up a disproportionate amount of their annual holiday entitlement during furlough, then there should be no bar to employers being allowed to require employees to use a proportionate amount of their annual holidays during a furlough period. And if you're acting reasonably, I think the likelihood of a challenge is relatively minimal. Government, of course, has amended or is amending the working time regulations to allow um, workers to carry holidays for up to two years if they can't take them because of the coronavirus crisis. And that's a useful thing that employers can use as well in order to stagger holidays over a longer period. But generally speaking, my advice would be that employers do need to think about this now and plan for a long period of disruption. Uh, that's going to require reviewing and revising holiday policies to ensure that you manage employee holidays over the course of this year and probably into next year. Um, and there are, what you want to do is you want to avoid finding at the end of next year that there are still huge numbers of employees with most of their annual holiday entitlements still to take. So that is going to require changes to your holiday policies and practices. I want to talk a little bit about what's going to happen now when furlough ends. It feels like we've only just started it. You know, the portal's just opened, but already we have to start thinking about what's going to happen at the end. Of course, the scheme currently is going to end at the end of June. Um, are employers looking at the end of furlough? Are they planning for that yet? Has the scheme what it's done what it's intended to do in the short term? Is it going to have a mid to longer term effect, etc.? Um, the scheme certainly has had an impact, and it's certainly the case that without it, we would have seen large-scale redundancies and unemployment. So in the short term, it's done, it's done what it says on the tin. In the mid to longer term, there are certainly going to be job losses. Um, employees who are currently furloughed um, certainly will face redundancy in the future, but the numbers are uncertain and there are many variables, not least and most importantly, probably, how we're going to extricate ourselves from lockdown and get back to something approaching normality. Um, if businesses anticipate that redundancies may still be required despite furlough support, they do need to start to plan for these now during furlough. Redundancy processes take time to complete properly. The cost of getting it wrong can be substantial. And it's also in itself an expensive and, and sometimes lengthy process. And you have to consider as a business whether any of these costs can be mitigated. Things you need to consider if you're looking at larger scale redundancies, 20 or more, then it's going to be a 30 or 45 day statutory consultation period. If you get that wrong, you may face protective award claims of up to 90 days gross pay per employee. Even with smaller numbers of employees, you need to plan for two or three weeks of consultation. Consultation may need to take place with elected representatives, so you'll need a process for nominating and electing representatives, which will be in addition to the time that you have to consult. And you have to think about how you're going to effectively consult with your workforce while they are remotely working, um, if that's the case. Um, how are employee representatives supposed to liaise with their constituents? Um, what facilities are you going to make available for them to undertake their job properly and how are you going to do that? There is an awful lot to consider here um, and I think businesses do need to start planning for that now if redundancies are a possibility at the end of the furlough period. Another important consideration is if you decide to proceed with redundancies, can you serve notice of redundancy during furlough and still receive government grant funding? or might that be regarded as being an abuse of the furlough scheme? It's not certain. My own opinion, uh, and it is an opinion, I'll caveat that again, is that you probably can do so, and everything in the guidance that we've seen indicates that you can. But I have been asked the question by some employers, and there isn't anything particularly clear in the guidance or the directions in relation to that. It would be extremely helpful if you can serve notice during furlough, because during notice period, in most cases, you will probably have to pay normal wages to the employee. But if you are still getting furlough support, then all you would have to do is top that up to normal wages. Um, a point very quickly on redundancy payments. Um, you'll need to understand um, if either through a redundancy policy or custom and practice, there's an obligation to pay more than the statutory minimum redundancy payments, what that is, and factor that into your thinking. Do please note that furlough pay cannot be used to pay redundancy payments. 
So redundancy aside, what are the other considerations for the end of furlough? Lockdown is not going to suddenly end. We know that now. It's, um, it's going to be a gradual return to normal over many months, probably um, through to the end of the year. During that period, social distancing will continue. Employers will have to think about what that means for them and how they'll implement that. My view, high density workplaces will not be permitted for some time to come. We'll require to make sure that employees have sufficient space between them at work. That likely means reduced numbers of people in the workplace at any one time. So you'll need to think about how you manage that. That might be continued home working for some or all. Rotational working, bringing some in, um, leaving others at home and then rotating around. Regular deep cleaning of workstations, I think will be very important. Provision of PPE. I suspect employers will have an obligation under general health and safety legislation to provide appropriate PPE for their employees when they're at work. Um, think about staggering working hours, so you know that everybody arriving at the same time or leaving at the same time or indeed taking breaks at the same time. And, and in effect, measures similar to those implemented by shops to maintain social distancing insofar as that's translatable to your workplace. Um, I want to say very quickly a word or two on home working because it's something that I think has proven to be remarkably resilient um, over the last couple of months or so. And I think the myths about employees not working while at home have been thoroughly debunked, at least for the time being. My view, I think increased home working is here to stay. It has obvious benefits. There will be some cost savings for businesses on space. Reduced commuting will, will be a benefit to everybody. Um, save time, save cost, um, improved health and safety is something that I personally loathe. Um, so if we can do less commuting, that's got to be a good thing. And generally, well-being of staff. What I see is people do enjoy working from home. Um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a funny period, not all negative. There's been some horrific things happening, of course. Um, but the experiences of people working from home generally haven't been awful. Um, so there's a lot to think about there. Um, these are things to consider as we go forward. Um, I'll leave it there because we are very short of time, but if there are any questions, we'll try to fit them in. Thanks very much. I've forgotten to unmute there. Um, th thank you very much to all of our um, speakers. I'm going to hand over to Paul Atkinson. All of the questions have been dealt with during the session, so thank you very much. But if anybody has anything um, that they want to discuss later on, you've got the info at SBRC email address that um, you can... Um, have a you can have a look at next week um, on Tuesday we've got another webinar around um, the startup funding so what does that mean for any startups you might be dealing with and stuff as well so um, that will be going out on on all of our social media panels later on so yeah have a look at that so over to Paul Thanks, Jude. Sorry about that. I was having, struggling to get my mute off. Well, it's been a great session this morning. Um, I won't use the word unprecedented again. Uh, it's been used by pretty much everybody, I think. Um, we've always got an e immediate COVID impact, but I think everyone now realises, as David Hughes said there, that uh, this is going to go on for a while. Um, and the econ economic impact is going to be something we've never really experienced before. Uh, and so we've really got to gear ourselves up for that. But I just wanted to uh, outline a few kind of key points and takeaways I had. Uh, first of all, Carol, you know, the importance of storytelling uh, you know, to get the message across and have people understand what you're trying to do. Um, delivering on your promises, um, prioritizing fun and well-being, I think really important. Um, and, in business, and, and I think Carol's uh, description really explained how business resumption is going to be really complicated. It's not going to be straightforward. You've got to plan for it. Uh, and, you know, what do you want to be known for when this is all, uh, I was going to say back to normal. I, I'm not sure back to normal is going to be the same normal. And then Julian, I mean, listening to, you know, um, an organisation, 25 offices around the, around the world, eight different legal um, um, arenas, um, one weekend to create a brand new online proposition. Amazing. Um, and... You know, I think, uh, Julian, I'll outline one thing which is pretty clear to me, and that is that uh, people are going to have to challenge their current business models and their cost models and organisational models going forward. Uh, continue as we did before, it's probably not going to be an option. Uh, and then with Wendy, uh, you know, um, interesting to hear about the kind of flexible, pro flexible approach to implementing the IT systems to support people, realising a lot of systems were there. In any case, they worked pretty well. Again, fun was mentioned um, and the importance of well-being. 
you know, and you know, and Charlotte, um, um, and Charlotte talked uh, uh, in quite a bit of detail about the use of the portal. Lots of great practical advice, and again, David Hughes has uh, uh, reinforced um, uh, the furlough scheme with some great legal uh, and practical advice. I just want to finish off by saying um, I don't think anything is going to be the same after this, uh, and we need to prepare for that. And there's a few key things I wanted to mention. Uh, one is that uh, change and pace of change will be the norm. Uh, it, this, it, we're not going to go back to a stable process where everything just works smoothly all the time, which will mean new business models, um, obviously an emphasis on more remote working, but also remote delivery of services and propositions, uh, which, we heard, which we heard about earlier on from Julian. I think people are going to really focus very heavily on reducing their fixed costs. Uh, and that implies things like office space, um, fixed salaries, uh, a number of different areas, uh, and fixed organisation. Um, and I think that will challenge how we go forward with uh, organisational structures and cost structures that suit the new norm. Uh, we will come out of it, um, but I think we'll come out of it and we'll need lots and lots of new propositions that we don't currently have. Uh, and the idea of product market fit will, I think, change completely. Um, I think I'll leave it there. It's been a great session. Um, thanks to Jude and uh, the rest of the panelists. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a great rest of the day and a great weekend. Thanks. I'd also like to say uh, thank you to Simone because she pulled all this together um, but wouldn't do the intro. She said she might do the next one. So this wasn't my do and Paul, so don't thank me for this. Um, she's been amazing and has worked with all the speakers to pull together a really um, great session with good as we all said good news stories and something positive for people to uh, finish off the weekend finish off and head on into the weekend with thank you very much everybody see you all again yeah, thanks everybody um thanks Simone. bye